Hello, and welcome back for another affiliate-focused branch of the UF Care podcast. These are conversations with early career professionals studying addiction research here at the University of Florida, as well as providing advice and support for those entering the field. My name is Victor. I'm a fourth-year graduate student here in the Department of Clinical Health Psychology, working for Dr. Jeff Boisino, and today is going to be a little different. Our guest today is Dr. Oliver Grundman, who is a clinical professor in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry here at the University of Florida. Dr. Grundman is also a host of the UF Care podcast, so in many ways, my better half. Thank you, Victor, for allowing me to have this conversation with you. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to have this kind of crossover episode. Right, right. Uh, I also want to congratulate you. I saw online that you've been recently named president-elect of the American College of Clinical Pharmacology. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, I was fortunate enough to be elected by the board to have that responsibility over the next few years. When does your term start? It starts actually pretty soon uh, in September at the annual meeting. And and then it's two years president-elect, two years president, and two years immediate past president. So it's it's a six-year commitment. Got it. And how will that work into your responsibilities to the podcast? So uh, the American College of Clinical Pharmacology, it has been around for a very long time, about um, 50, about 60 years now, almost. So almost, almost as long as the podcast. Almost as long as the podcast, yes. <laughs> so you're dating me here. No. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, when, I, when I became a member of ACCP, and this was through the efforts of um, Dr. Hartmut Derendorf, who is uh, kind of a... Uh, a very impactful researcher in the area of clinical pharmacology and pharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. Uh, I was just a student member and I didn't do much with it, uh, with that membership. Uh, But then in 2015 or so, so about seven years ago, I became more involved uh, first on the, on the student and early stage career professional level. And then I kind of ascended, so to say, uh, to, uh, to become secretary of the organization uh, Board of Regents member, and it's um, all kind of tying together because when you look at clinical pharmacology and how it affects the drug development process from preclinical to clinical to then actually on the market, a lot of what we're doing in our research is at various points when we look at um, substance use disorders, many of the drugs that enter the market eventually will have to be evaluated for their potential for abuse or for dependence development. So that is one component. The other component is there's a crossover between what I'm doing, natural products with psychoactive uh, activity uh, or psychoactive effects and the drug development process. uh, Because much of where we, or at least 50% of where we start now with our design of a new structure is from nature still Uh, and kind of the pipeline in terms of entirely synthetic uh, derivatives is drying up so we kind of switching back to natural products as lead compounds and then going from there and uh, design uh, semi-synthetic derivatives that is so interesting so you're referring to nature to see what is what is already out there and then kind of tweaking it to see if you can make it work what are there any recent examples that you would be interesting to share if you're able to? So uh, one of my primary research um, focuses at the moment is on Kratom, um, Mitragina speciosa. And uh, there is somebody at UF who's also part of UF Care, uh, Christopher McCurdy, Dr. Christopher McCurdy, who has received quite a bit of money from NIDA to study Kratom. Uh, both in the preclinical and then in the early clinical setting. Uh, To date, there aren't many clinical trials. But what I'm looking at when it comes to Kratom is, initially I looked at um, surveys um, uh, to evaluate the use pattern of how Kratom is used, online surveys among Kratom users. And this has kind of uh, branched out a little bit because now we're looking at particular 
products or formulations that are available in the market. So Quantum isn't isn't regulated on the federal level, um, but it is regulated in several states, uh, and it's not approved as a dietary supplement. So it's kind of in this grayish area, uh, but it definitely has effects on the CNS. And what what I'm looking at is what kind of benefits do users report and then we link that bad back to the actual alkaloids that are present in kratom uh, and, and and basically what we're looking at primarily are kratom alkaloids indoor alkaloids uh, mitragynin is the primary alkaloid that has been found um, and the activities uh, that chris is looking at in animal models or in vitro cell lines is uh, primarily on the opioid receptor on the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, on serotonin receptors. So it's what we call a dirty drug, right? It doesn't only act on one particular target, but it acts on multiple targets. And this is very much in line with what we see with many of the CNS active drugs, no matter if it's antidepressants that are uh, prescription drugs, or if it's illicit drugs. We often have multiple effects mediated through multiple receptor systems that then create this kind of um, sometimes not as clear cut effects uh, that users report in a dose dependent manner. Mm -hmm. For folks who are less familiar with Kratom and its effects on the central nervous system, what is that experience usually like for those who take it? So uh, I have never taken Kratom myself. I'm probably one of the few folks uh, who are doing research on Kratom who has never consumed it. Uh, but the, the reports vary depending on what kind of product is being consumed. So traditionally, Kratom is consumed in Southeast Asia. Either the fresh leaves are chewed very briefly for a stimulant, caffeine-like effect or coffee-like effect. Uh, and then people also brew a tea and a water infusion out of it, let it steam for about two to three hours, and then they drink it primarily for pain, uh, for chronic or acute pain conditions. It's also been used uh, for fever reduction and for the treatment of gastrointestinal issues, which kind of links it a little bit to its opioid effects, right? When we think about the pain relieving effects, uh, diarrhea, this is where we have some opioids that are acting peripherally. Loperamide is probably a great example for that. Um, but then also the stimulant effects, which are not really mediated or we, we, can, we don't associate opioid-like effects with stimulant effects. And this is where the discrepancy or the uniqueness of the kratom alkaloids comes into play, apparently. We don't know necessarily if it's all just related to mitragynin or if there are other alkaloids as well, speculosiliate, and there are mm -hmm. about 40 alkaloids that have been identified so far. So it's likely a, a synergistic additive effect of various alkaloids that are present in kratom and potentially other compounds that we don't know yet. Right. And so the, the variety of uh, experiences that individuals can have in taking Kratom in these different ways and the effect that it has on the body you know, kind of speaks to its nature as a dirty drug with all these different alkaloids and all these different receptors being impacted. It's doing so much. And it sounds like your work is trying to figure out how specifically you can get it to work for specific problems. Yes. So from the surveys, uh, I first wanted to see how is it used? How much is used? Uh, what is the demographics of the user population? And then what are some distinguishing features of who is using it for what indication? Are there doses that are specifically uh, used for treating uh, a psychiatric condition? Uh, for example, self-treating depressive or anxiety disorders. Are, are there specific subgroup of people that are using it, for example, for mitigating withdrawal symptoms of illicit or prescription drug use. Uh, and then there's obviously the, the large amount of people or users that are using it for uh, self-treatment of acute or chronic pain conditions. And it's really interesting that about 70%, and that's not only based on the surveys that I conducted, but also other surveys, 70% are actually using it for a psychiatric condition. 
depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and then there is like about 50%, 50 to 60%. So there's some crossover, some overlap. People are using it for multiple uh, health conditions or self-diagnosed symptoms that they experience. About 50 to 60% are using it for acute or chronic pain. But also we have about 10%, 10 to 15% in various studies that are using it to mitigate uh, withdrawal symptoms from an illicit or a prescription drug. Prescription okay. drugs, primarily we have benzodiazepines, um, uh, stimulants uh, and, or antidepressants and opioids. And in the illicit um, sector, we also have opioids, uh, benzodiazepines and amphetamine. That is really interesting. I, uh, I've heard a little bit about Kraton, but this is like more uh, information about how people use it and what it can be used for than I had been exposed to in the past. So uh, thank you for for sharing all of this. Yeah, I can get easily, thank you for, for letting me share. I can easily go on for like hours potentially talking about it. I don't think we technically have a time limit on these podcast <laughs> episodes. So if you want... Uh, is would you say this is your main line of research right now, Oliver? Yes, definitely. Okay. You, uh, so, yeah. yeah, how did you get here? It's. Uh, I think everybody has a unique story to tell, and based on on your own experiences, you know, uh, with with folks that you have been um, have had the pleasure with uh, with interviewing and talking to, and the same on my end. Um, it, it's just so fascinating how people got to where they are now in addiction research or substance use disorders. Uh, so I, I'm originally from Germany. Maybe my accent kind of gives it away. I studied pharmacy there and I always was interested in pharmacology and to some degree uh, pharmacognosy, which is the study of natural products uh, with any kind of pharmacological activity. Uh, and the pharmacy studies in Germany are a little bit different. They're more, more focused on analytical techniques and kind of, you know, not so clinically focused as it is here in the United States. Um, and then during my final semesters, I think it was the last or second to last semester, I, I met my doctoral advisor uh, and she was just getting... Uh, she was just offered and accepted a position at the University of Florida to start her research. So that was still back in Germany. Mm. Uh, and she was asking me, hey, do you want to do your PhD? So I I never intentionally actually wanted to get a graduate degree. Uh, I, I would, would be content to, to be a pharmacist, but that was an opportunity that I then uh, accepted. And I did my, my PhD studies with a focus on uh, the psychoactivity of natural products. Uh, I focused on a different natural product, uh, but we did work with St. John's Word. We did work with Salvia Divinorum. Um, uh, we did, my work was focused on an antidepressant and anxiolytic activity of um, uh, dogbane, uh, Venetian dogbane, Apocynum venetum, uh, which has since basically completely uh, disappeared. I'm, I'm not working with that any longer. But it was interesting to look at uh, it from, from animal models, from in vitro models, and all of that kind of stuff, and kind of uh, tackle out what the active or proposed active ingredients were. Very different from, from what I'm doing now uh, with, with Kratom, but the, the, old, the, the commonality in all of it is I'm looking at natural products um, with the potential for CNS activity. Right. It's always so interesting to hear the the path that people's lives and careers take and how sort of in hindsight, you can see those central themes, but in the moment, it, it can seem so random, the directions that things go. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah. I also want to note Venetian dark bane sounds wild. Is that like, that's <laughs> such a strong name of a substance. Um, like it makes me think of like a like a fantasy poison or something like Game yeah. of Thrones, you know? Yeah, it is actually a. Is it, it is really? Actually, it is. It's not a poison for men, but it's a poison for dogs. Oh no! Um, so dogs really, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it originated was first discovered in the Mediterranean area. So mm -hmm. 
Venice and, and Venetian, but I actually looked at it, it was my products that I received were primarily from Japan, um, but it's exactly the same as you can find in the Mediterranean. Wow. But now the work is on, is on Kratom. Yes. Uh, what most excites you about that kind of work? So when I, when I got into it, uh, when I first became aware of Kratom, that was uh, in 2016, uh, I did not know anything. Like most people uh, didn't know much about Kratom at all. And it was brought to my attention by a student of mine, a master's student who worked in, uh, in, a, in a forensic laboratory setting. And he said, I have an interesting case uh, where a, a relatively young person uh, apparently was found to have taken it among other things that they took um, and had a, had a fatal car accident. And it, it's not entirely sure if it was a suicide or what played into it. Um, and that was the first time I was exposed to it. And we started researching a little bit more. Another student came into this project and then we wrote a review paper on what we know to date uh, about Kratom at that point in 2016. And then I looked in the literature further uh, during during our studies, and it was like, we don't really know who is using Kratom. We don't know for what purposes it's being used. So why don't I just jump into the deep end and uh, design a survey and send this out to Kratom users? Uh, and that was the start of it. Uh, I've been now uh, involved with some NIDA research. I've been involved with um, some research with folks in Southeast Asia. Uh, so it's really a, a tight knit community. And it's interesting that we all focus on different aspects while not really necessarily having to compete for, uh, for grants or funding or stepping on each other's toes. So that has been really rewarding for me. That's wonderful. I'm glad that you all are getting to really build this body of research about this new kind of natural substance and starting to explore what it can do for the body from all these different perspectives collaboratively internationally as a community yeah it has really been uh rewarding and it, it's it's interesting because some consumers may think that oh it's natural it's it's going to be fine but it's definitely not, as we know with so many other products that occur naturally. Which... Venetian dark pain. Venetian dark pain. <laughs> uh, but, you know, think about morphine, right? Think about opium, mm -hmm. think about cocaine as natural products. And I don't think that many people would, would say this is a completely inert or sh cannot do any harm to the body. I think most people would agree that there is quite a potential for, um, for doing substantial harm. Mm -hmm. So what is next? As you as you ascend to president elect and <laughs> continue to get involved, uh, what is what is next for you and your career in this research? I I definitely want to stay engaged uh, with quantum research uh, through collaborations, uh, through doing uh, uh, continuing uh, the patterns of use research. Um, I think it's an exciting and uh, and and just great way to remain engaged with with the research community in that way, uh, with a small research community who is doing research on it. Um, my passion has always been teaching and educating ever since I went through graduate school. Um, so the the major chunk of my work um, at UF will be focused on directing the two uh, master's degrees in pharmaceutical chemistry and clinical toxicology. Uh, that still remains kind of my my main work uh, and, and line of income. So so to be uh, true about that and honest about that. Mm -hmm. um, within ACCP, I, I am excited to work with everybody in this organization uh, to make it really a, uh, a staple, not only on a national but international level when it comes to uh, engaging different stakeholders because it's really a, a multifaceted organization. We have folks from industry, from regulatory agencies, uh, from the clinical practice setting and from academia. And we all come together at the annual meeting and throughout the year to really tackle some of the, the 
leading problems or the leading issues affecting that community, the clinical pharmacology community. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have no doubt from you know, getting to know you and, and your work through the podcast, you're very good at bringing people together. And so I, I have no doubt you will be anything but wildly successful in this position. Thank you. That you're setting expectations for me. I, I hope I can meet them. This is all written. Once this is once this is published, it's all set. It's got to happen. Um, I have one more question for you, Oliver, before we call it for today, and that is, what sort of advice you might have for folks folks who are listening to this conversation, uh, who are at other stages of their careers, and might see the kind of work and path that you have had, and think, "Gosh, that's so cool. I want that." What advice would you have for them? Um, I, I, from my own experience, I can tell folks that keep your mind open to opportunities. Sometimes they come in very unexpectedly. Uh, there's a fork in the road and you can, you can follow what you have planned five years ago uh, and just be determined to move forward on that or you can take the other path um, that might at first appear somewhat um, unusual or has not been tread as far as often, uh, but it is an opportunity for you. Um, and sometimes we, we have to take risks in life. Yes. Are they always going to pay off? Mm, maybe not, but it is the experiences that we gain from them, the insights that we gain from them. Uh, I engaging with people, building a network, uh, finding your peers, your kind of crowd that shares your interests and your passion. Um, if we consider how much time we spend on a, on a, on a weekly basis or throughout our whole life working, um, we, we have to find, or I, I can only encourage everybody to find something that they're really passionate about. Yes, there will be tough days and days where we just want to retire tomorrow. Uh, but there are other days where we just can spend the whole day into the late night hours just looking at data or uh, discussing things with our peers. And this is, I think, what drives us. Find these moments. Find this passion for your work, no matter where you are in your career. Um, I think even if you were in a late stage, later stage or middle stage of your career, there might still be new opportunities. So I wouldn't narrow uh, my vision uh, to to just stay just stay in this one path, in this one lane, but keep opportunities that arise open in your mind. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today, Oliver. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Victor. It was a pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Happy Friday. Happy Friday as well. <laughs> yes. Thank God. I know. <laughs> uh, and I will talk with you again real soon. Okay, Victor. Thank you so much. You're a great host. Thank you. You are too. Of course, we can't forget to give a thanks to the University of Florida Center for Addiction Research and Education, Dr. Sarah Jo Nixon, Dr. Joanne Paris, and all of our mentors and future collaborators. Till next time.